Today our Pentecost texts speak a lot about inhaling and how we're inspired, but this Pentecost we also need to be involved in conspiring. So let us pray, and then I'll try my best to explain how God's Spirit is conspiring in the bones and the wind. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. About 2,100 years ago, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon captured Jerusalem and took many of its leaders into captivity, including the prophet Ezekiel. The captives were never imprisoned in Babylon. They were free. They were free to marry. They were free to build homes, free to plant crops, free to own and, and run businesses, and free to worship their God. Many thrived in this environment, but for all of them, there was always a deep yearning to go home again, to return to the life and the land they had known before. There was always a heaviness of heart that couldn't just be glossed over. There was always a pain that could not be filled. There was always a sadness that moved through their bodies and could be felt right down to their bones. We can identify with Ezekiel and his compatriots in exile. Although we are beginning to return to our new, new normal, there is a lament, there is a weeping, there's a yearning deep in our bones. We long to fully return. We long to hold each other. We are trying to remember what this place that has been taken from us feels like and looks like and smells like and tastes like. We yearn to return. We are trying to remember what each of our loved ones here looks like and feels like. The separation is still very real. The loneliness for many of us is still palpable. The longing is real, and for some of us on given days, it hurts. However, we are blessed as people of God to know that this story doesn't end here. It never ends here. Although exile and separation feel so close, we know that God's story and God's creative energy never ends in emptiness and despair. It simply has its beginning there. God's story is a never-ending tale of resurrection hope. God rises when others collapse. When others give up, that's when God shows up. Here in Ezekiel 37, God takes his prophet Ezekiel by the hand while in exile and leads him into Death Valley, the valley of dry bones. As far as the eye can see, there are dry bones strewn everywhere. There is this valley, valley of dry bones in which God calls the prophet to do something in the presence of God. It's a question that he gives to the prophet, and I translate it directly from the Hebrew. Son of humankind, will these bones ever live again, is what God asks. And Ezekiel replies, <clears throat> you, my Lord God, who reveal your loving kindness and justice. Only you know the answer. So God commands Ezekiel with the answer. God commands Ezekiel to prophesy these words to those bones. Dry bones, hear the word of God. Thus says the Lord God who reveals his loving kindness and justice spoken to these bones Behold, I will bring spirit into you, and you will live again. With these words, words of loving kindness, injustice, spoken to the bones, the bones begin to take shape again. Bone to bone, sinew to sinew, skin to skin, and finally breath and spirit move into these bodies, and the feet are on, the people, and all these be beings are on their feet. 
a very great host. Now these bones don't only rise and take life again, they return to the fullness of life and they return home. I ask, who among us is greater than God? Who will it be that we elect to go and say to God when we're separated and dispersed and dried up and all done, who is it that's going to ask and say to God in defiance, you can't do this because it can't be done? Well, I don't know if one of the rest of my colleagues is going to take that job, but I certainly am not. One of the things I've learned over time is never tell God what God can't do. Which one of us is faithless enough to try that? You see, only God can raise the dead. In Ezekiel, God displays the power and presence of resurrection hope. And this is just the first lesson of the day. If that's too fanciful for you, this vision of dry bones rising, if it's too strange, perhaps too metaphorical, perhaps too apocalyptic or something else, then come with me to Jerusalem, A.D. 33, where the Spirit of God moves from bones to wind. On that day, Pentecost people were gathered from every nation under heaven and at least a few nations that Luke didn't even know the names of, right? They had all come together. There they were in Jerusalem from all over the place. It sounds to me like a sunlit version of New York's Times Square on New Year's Eve. Jerusalem is crowded and festive. There are high spirits, bad manners, jostling, jostling, bargaining going on everywhere. It's bizarre and the, and, and the, the metropolis itself is a bizarre. Here in the metropolis, there's a backdrop unfolding. There's one act that's happening only, and that's the Holy Spirit moving to change history. This time, God doesn't choose an apocalyptic kind of prophet in a valley all by himself with dry bones. This time, God chooses the packed capital city on one of the highest holy days of Judaism to flip the script on human history. When the day dawns, there are about 120 Jesus movement people moping around, wondering what they're gonna do next without a savior. Suddenly, a holy hurricane heads their way. By biblical accounting, this mighty wind with tongues of fire, the breath of God, comes blasting into the center of the city and changes everything. Before any of them can defend themselves against the power of God, they are all hit by God's spirit and they're burnt with flames of faith and they are filled from every one of their cells in their body by the breath and the power of God. And they're speaking in all sorts of different tongues. And this Times Square-like crowd at midday, not midnight, hears them speaking and understands that these simple Galileans, none of whom has a PhD or a high school education or understands any Middle Eastern language, has just changed everything. Shy people become bold people. Scared people become gutsy people. Lost people find an unconditional sense of direction. Disciples begin to discover abilities within themselves that they didn't even know they had or believed they were capable of. They open their mouths to speak, and guess what comes out? They start sounding like Jesus. That's right. They have been touched by this holy wind, and they're beginning to finally reflect the words and the spirits of Jesus. They touch people who are sick as though Jesus is there doing the healing and those people are healed. Now just 53 nights before this, Peter couldn't even defend Jesus against the words of a woman warming her hands at midnight by firelight on the night in which his master and teacher was tortured unto death. He couldn't even admit that he knew him. Now Peter stands in the streets and preaches to thousands of people. He has to convince them, while convicting them, that he isn't drunk, 
at midday. He is so bold on this day that he delivers something that there's no preacher in the history of the world has done since. He delivers a six-part sermon. He has six points. So I say he must have been drunk to do something like that. But first of all, here they are. The kingdom of God is at hand. Second, the coming of God's kingdom is directly related to its ministry and to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Third, Jesus now sits at the right hand of God as the messianic head of Israel. Fourth, the Holy Spirit has come upon them as a sign of Christ's presence and glory. Fifth, the messianic age will shortly reach its consummation and Christ will come again. And finally, all who hear this message must repent, ask for God's forgiveness, receive salvation, and enter into the power of the Holy Spirit. That's really cool. He delivers all of that with power and presence. And when Pentecost ends, the Jesus movement has grown from 120 people to 3,000. It now has a new name. It's called the Kyriakos, those of the Lord. And there's no explanation for what happened that day, except that newcomers and disciples have been overwhelmed by the breath of God. They sucked in God's own breath and they were absolutely changed and transformed by it. They heard and felt good news, and they were transformed by it. Folks who had been inhaling fear and uncertainty breathed in new life and began to exhale faith and boldness. Those who were worn out from exhaustion and buried on the trail were renewed and revived so much that they each broke into and let out a new breath the breath of God. And this is where inspiration turns to conspiration. Let me explain. To conspire means literally to breathe together. To conspire means to breathe together. So let's try this. Let's conspire together by breathing together. Let's all take a breath, everyone. Take a breath. And take another one. And take a third one, just to show COVID how tough we are. There you go. We have all just launched a conspiracy. Can you hear the word spirit in there? To conspire means to literally be filled with the same spirit to be enlivened by the same wind. What happens when we come together in worship is that the Holy Spirit swoops in among us, knits us together through, through songs and anthems, through children's time and adult time, through prayers and litanies, through baptism and Holy Communion. Our many breaths become one breath. Our many and varied voices become one. For a point in time, one voice, and the breath of God becomes the, consp the conspiring fire for community in Christ. Thousands of years ago, God asked Ezekiel, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel said, I don't know, but I know you know. The way God shared knowledge then was to send the Holy Spirit, the Ruach, the breath of God, to lift the bones and they came together, and in the same way, the question came back much, much later. 600 years later, it comes back again. The hurricane of the Holy Spirit sweeps through the despairing and dried up people on the first Pentecost and sets them on fire for God. All of this is, is nice. It's really nice. It's great literature. We have powerful images. But what about us? What about God coming right now? to you, right where you are, right here, right now? What about fire and power and spirit and breath of God for this day, for this time, for your life, for this community? See, I believe that the spirit is conspiring as we speak. Vaccinated, we are on our way back to health. By the way, part of the conspiracy of hope. I quoted him a million times already since he said this a few weeks ago. 
Dr. Andy Thomas of, w, uh, of OSU Wexner Medical Center said, the vaccine is like a brick wall and COVID hits that wall and falls powerless to the ground. The image of COVID-19 dead on the ground with no chance of rising, by the way, is quite beautiful to me. I saw two statistics this week that I shared with some of you since January 2021, so five months ago, over 99% of all hospital admissions with COVID-19 have been unvaccinated people. 99% over that. And over 99.8%, which is almost 100% of all COVID-related deaths since January, have been unvaccinated people. So if you want to spread love, get a vaccine. If you want to spread COVID, don't. But let's not do the second thing because we are filled with the Holy Spirit and we actually want to come together to spread love again. But beyond the pandemic, I see the conspiring of the Holy Spirit in our faith community. I'm aware that I feel something very special happening at First Church. I'm gonna call it a conspiracy, a conspiracy of reconciliation, a conspiracy of faith, a conspiracy of grace, a conspiracy of hope, a conspiracy of love. This Pentecost Sunday, we are growing while we are apart. We added 16 new members in the past eight days to First Congregational Church. Let's say their names. Elijah and Samuel, Elias and Ruby, Abigail and Maya, Jacob and Lila, LJ and Mary Jo, Beth and John and Chris and John and Karen and Janice. All 16 of these people of faith are amazing to me. Thanks be to God for each one of you. Some of you have never entered this house of worship, never. Some of you have come in only once. But nevertheless, you have joined us on this journey of faith. Now that's a conspiracy of faith, if I ever heard of one. Now soon, these doors will be open again. You will return stronger, and you will return changed by the journey of the past 14 and 15 months. You will return more convicted and more conspiring and conspired by the Holy Spirit. Call it what you will, each of us is being called by God to be here for some deep and abiding season. There is no mistake, God has a plan for us here, and it is a plan that will include all of us and more than we ever dreamed possible. Like on the first Pentecost, more will come because of our faithfulness. It is a plan that is and will continue to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. So may God's Spirit in the bones and the wind today move you. I pray that your bones and your breath may inherit the wind of conspiracy as we breathe together and walk together in all God's ways. Come Holy Spirit, don't linger, come now. Amen.